Hands together one more time for Jesus. Take your Bibles and go with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Uh, God put a word in my spirit. I was going to finish our series on, on marriage, and I'm still going to finish it. I, I, but how many know it's better to follow the Lord than to do your own thing? Amen. I, I, could, teach, I could teach on it, but life seems to come when we follow the, and are obedient to the Lord. Uh, again, our church is a church. We do read the New King James, but we also read the NLT. Uh, I, I want to go out of the NLT today uh, to talk about um, digging. I want to talk about digging. Digging, a found, digging to a foundation or digging a foundation. That's what I want to talk about with a parable in the Bible, it would be called the parable of the two builders, but I want to talk about digging. We have to remember that being saved is not just coming to church. It's a life and it's a lifestyle. And because it is a life and a lifestyle, we, we have to be mindful that God wants to use your life to get glory. Glory is the reflection of God in our lives. Uh, and, and because of that, that is something we got to always remember that just like God wants to use our lives for his glory, so does the devil. Just because you get saved, the devil doesn't stop messing with you. If anything, the devil is going to try to do everything he can to minimize and turn your glory down for God and turn it up for him. That's why he comes at you. That's why he Things always happen to you because it is not that things are going to come to you. It is the fact that it is going to be how you react and respond. Uh, keep your finger in Luke 6 because let me preface it with these two scriptures to help you see something. Go to Luke 17. Keep your finger in Luke 6. Go to Luke 17 and we're going to go look at these scriptures and then we are going to pray and then we're going to get into the word this morning. Amen. Look at Luke chapter 17, verse number 1, uh, whichever version you have it. Make sure you bracket this, put stars around this. Make sure you put this in your Bible and meditate and understand this. Look at what it says. One, G one day, Jesus said to his disciples, there will always be temptations to sin. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? See that? You watch this. I'm going to read it again. There will sometimes be temptation. Hmm. Four of y'all got it. Let me see if I can get everybody. Else up. There will sometimes be temptation. There will what? There will what? Be what? To do what? Hmm. always but listen to what it says because here's here's something we must consider but what awaits the person who does the tempting but what awaits the person who does the tempting hmm it would be better to be thrown watch this into the sea with the millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin so NLT says this, so watch yourselves. Watch, watch yourselves. Be careful that you don't become a temptress or a tempter. The Bible says it would be better for you to hang a, a rock around your neck and fall into the sea. Okay, keep it, keep, stay in Luke 6. Now I'll go over to Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. I mean, I, I could preach this on that, but I, I don't want to preach this thing that God put in my spirit. Luke chapter, I mean, Matthew 18, I want you to see it in Matthew's gospel because it is, there is there too. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 7. Now listen to what this says. Now this is interesting. You might stay in Luke 6, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into the Bible. So you got to be careful now. Watch yourselves because there's, always you're gonna always be tempted to sin but just because you tempted don't mean you have to 
I got I to say this. And just because you think it doesn't mean you've sinned. Thoughts will always fly around your head like birds. But that doesn't mean you have to do it, or that doesn't mean that you sin just because you thought it. Remember, the Bible says you have to repent for every idle word and every idle deed. Thoughts come, the devil, thoughts are going to always be there, but you have to monitor your thoughts and your words and your actions. That's what you get judged on. That's why the Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. See, that, that's why you got to think. My, my wife has helped me a lot. You got to think before you speak. Because once you say it, you can't take it back. And you know the old saying, if you ain't got nothing good to say, just don't say nothing. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 7. What sorrow awaits the world, watch this, because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to end eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better, it's better to end eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fire with hell. Beware that you do not look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. Now let me clarify this, because you know you got crazy folk in church. This is figuratively, y'all. This is not literal. Don't go cut your hand and feet off. Don't go cut it off. Don't gouge your eye out. What it's saying is whatever is causing you to sin, get it out your life. HBO, stars, sin to the max, Cinemax. If you know you can't go watch Fifty Shades of Grey, you single and you go see Fifty Shades of Grey and you sitting there fanning yourself when them sexy go get out. If you around folk, there's always, you got a girlfriend or a friend that's always telling you about that. They, they, they little exploits, girl, mm, I put chocolate and whipped cream, and I'll see you tomorrow. Hello, you got a sister, cousin, or aunt? No, you, you know I'm telling you the truth. There's people in your life that are tempting you, that are sowing seeds into you that can cause, you need to cut them off. Hello? If somebody, if somebody in your life is always making you mad, then you need to get rid of that person for a while till you can check yourself. But if they get you to the point where you start cussing, you have to get around some people, and then all of a sudden you understand at the end of the day when you're with them, they, you cussing. You're like, where in the world did this come from? Hello? If you... If you, if you got a girlfriend and every time you come over her house, she wearing short shorts and no bra, bye. Right. Cut it off. Oh, oh, what, 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 why y'all get all quiet? If you went around a dude and, and he's all the time, you come around, his shirt all the way buttoned down, he's smelling all good, and you, you finding yourself drawing closer and closer, the closer I get to you, the more you make me sin. Cut them off. Because you on your way to fall. Hello. Lord, we bless you and we thank you today. We give you the glory, honor, and the praise for what you have done and what you're doing. God, we thank you and we bless you right now. Help us, Lord, as we expound and enter into and get into the word of God. I decrease that you may increase. That is you that's seen and not me. So, Father, help us, and we thank you. Now, God, no matter how anointed I am to preach the word of God, teach the word of God, anoint the hearers to receive word that is able to be engrafted to save their soul. Lord, I thank you, and I bless you right now for this moment and this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to use yesterday's funeral as a launch pad to understand something that Sister William's son grew up in church. But then one moment, one, 
one incident and he was he was in a situation where somebody pushed him and he snapped and forgot who he was and it cost him his life and I say that with all respect but number one all of us need to understand there are and there can be something that'll push you to the point where you could kill somebody you ask any mother somebody mess with their child they're going to forget Jesus and they're going parents have died trying to save their child from drowning see so let's not be let's not let's not be naive and think that we're invincible from something happening to our life that could cause us that could cost us or cause us to forget that we're believers let's not let's not be stupid let, let's not be stupid one one if you don't if you're not honest with yourself about where you are and what you're going through and what's up with you right now it, it, you'll be surprised what you will do you'll sleep with somebody you'll cut somebody you'll cut somebody out you'll have road rage just like that you just that quick so we've got to always be honest. Matter of fact, let's, let's read the scripture. I'm going to show you scripture that, that, that we've got to always understand. And this is one of the things that motivates me as a teacher because a lot of people have to be taught the word and we need to be taught right so that we understand what we're in. You are always in a fight. You are always, you're always in a fight. And, and the fight, again, is to get you to forget that you're God's child. All right? So because of that, you gotta, that's why you have to stay in the Word. That's why you have to keep your mind in the Word. But not only do you must you stay in the Word, you must also be a doer of the Word. That's why today's message is talking about digging. That, that's why I want to put the onus on digging because we see the parable of these two builders. There's some, there's some incredible parallels that we want to look at. So look at, let's read it. Verse, uh, Matt, I mean Luke chapter 6, verse 46. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord? when you don't do what I say. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the flood waters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is what? Well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. Did you hear that? Now, I want you to understand the background of this. Jesus is in Palestine, and in Palestine, it is, it is a land of hills and mountains. Did you hear that? As a result, it is subject, watch this, to violent rains and sudden floods. The Jordan River annually swells to dangerous levels and becomes rapid and furious. The streams that run through the hills can suddenly swell with rain and spill tremendous amounts of water onto the plains below, sweeping everything before them. Houses erected within the reach of these sudden deluges, especially those founded on sand or other unreliable foundations, cannot stand before them. The rising streams shake a house to its foundation and erodes away its base until it falls. Rocks are common there. However, so it is hard to find a solid foundation. It's hard to find a solid foundation. The foundation we know is Christ. But understand this, both of these people are building houses. Understand that. Both of them are are building houses. Now, here's the thing you got to remember about this parallel, I mean, about this story. Apparently, they both are, 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 are familiar with where they're building their house. Both of them know that floods come. Now, watch this. Here's a, here's a sidebar. Here's, a, here's an amendment. Be careful when you ask for blessings because if you're not rooted right, it could destroy you. You better understand that. Be careful when you ask for a band. Be careful when you ask for a spouse. Be careful when you ask for a house. 
Because it's not, because understand materialism is amoral. It's not about what, what you get. It's who gets it because it depends on the motivation of the person that gets it. If you're not built on the right foundation, it can destroy you. Because I, I, I say this and I believe this. One of the greatest enemies of the believer is success. Because all success is not from God. All blessings are not from God. Remember, the devil won't bless you too, especially when he knows you're not built on the right foundation. So you got to understand, one person, they both see the plot. They both go to the office, they, 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 they sign the paperwork, they credit is in there, everything is all, all straight. And they say, okay, come on, we're going to show you your plot. We're going to show you. Now, you got to understand, they're in Palestine and, and rivers run. So you got to understand that if you're going to build by a river, number one, you better make sure that you get your soil checked out to make sure that the soil you're digging in isn't water. Because if you... Lay a foundation in water, you're going to have problems because the cement's not going to be able to take. It looks beautiful. But if you ever, if you ever been to a person that, that builds by a river, understand they always build away from the water, building closer to the land so that they can lay a deeper foundation. You don't want to be right there on the banks. And, 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 and people that want to build on the side of a mountain, you better make sure that if you're going to build on the side of a mountain, you have reinforcements, and you better make sure that you check the ground. Hello? Because you can be on, just like San Andreas, I'm trying to make it to the movie, I want to see that. Because, see, a lot of folks, see, see, understand something. People will sell you property. Be careful when people sell you stuff real cheap. I just said something right there, you should shout it on you. Because one person said, hey, look at this smooth ground. Look at this smooth, it's already ready. But the other person said, no, nah, I'm going to build over here on this rock. Because first of all, rock can absorb things that sand can't. And so here's this person he's going to build. He's going to say, okay, boom, boom, boom. I'm going to have to do some work. Here, be careful of religion that makes everything easy. Be careful of a church that, that doesn't require anything of you. Be careful of a relationship or people who want relationships with no work. Yeah. David said, I won't give God anything that doesn't cost me something. Hey, have, you, have, you ever, have you ever bought a knockoff? Ladies, you ever bought a knockoff coach or knockoff Louis Vuitton and then seen the real thing? Some of y'all making that kind of money. Cool. I mean, your tires should be real good. Amen. Praise God. Some about, have you ever, ever bought a knockoff? It's something to wait. There's something in the inside on how it's, how it's designed. It says Louis Vuitton on the outside, but on the inside, it's less than Louis. You might get Louis, but you ain't getting no Vuitton. You, you understand? Because, yeah, like one day I drove, I rented for the, for the church, I rented a, a Dodge a Chrysler 300. Looked like a Bentley. Looked like a Bentley. You get lots of look driving a 300 because it looked like a Bentley. But then one day I got in a Bentley. I was at the auto show with dreams <laughs> I manifested. <laughs> and I got in. That's when you used to get in it. And it's something about the leather seats that just hug your body. It's something about the carpet on the floor. It's something about the smell. It's a little bit different than a Dodge 300. I said, woo. My God. Mm. You know something bad when you just make you say, mm. There are relationships, see, that are okay. But you get into them because there's no work. But then you reap 
the no work when stuff go wrong and it collapses because there was nothing required of you to do. So just, just stay with me. I'm going to get into the text. The same thing holds true when God is working on you and he brings things to you to make you dig a little dig deeper to him. The reason why I, 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 I gave you those first scriptures was because you got to know, first of all, that temptations and storms are going to always come your way. Why do they come? They come as a result of the misfortune or the, or the lack of, of wanting to cooperate with God, but they also come to make us dig. Why? Because the Lord says, okay, I see you building your house, but if I don't get you to dig and put the foundation a little bit deeper, you might pass the, the drizzle. You may get past the light flurries, but there's going to come days that's going to be a deluge, that the storms are going to come, that's going to hit you from your kids to your job to your spouse to how you feel about yourself. You may have you ever had that hit you all on the same day where in the morning you looked in the mirror, you weren't happy with yourself. You got on the metro, somebody done got on your nerves. You got on your job, they came to ask you to come into the HR room because they had a bad report about you that somebody had lied on you. Then you get a phone call from your kid telling you he just got suspended. Now, if you don't have a strong foundation, there's the temptation to take your phone, go down to the Potomac, say the hell with it, and keep moving, get in your car, and just drive and never look back. Oh, y'all ain't never had one of them moments. There's a temptation to just walk away. There's a temptation to pull out a gun, put it to your head, or get a gun, go into your boss's office, and say, bang, bang. If, if, you, don't, if you don't take the time, go with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 for a second. I, I'm, I'm going to get in this. Then I'm going to finish. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5. Look at this. When you did say amen. Look at what it says, verse number 5. Examine yourselves to see if, you are, if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. It's verse 6. As you test yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. Now, I don't want to get into that, but he says examine yourselves. Have, have, you ever, have you ever walked on your deck and heard it creak or seen little bugs fly away? You better get orking to make sure that those little bugs are not termites because you'll step out there one day and go through the deck. You, you better test your faith, your trust and confidence in the character of God. I'm telling you, y'all need to come to Wednesday night Bible study because we lay in the foundation because you need to know what real faith is. So when you come up against the storms, you have the faith. See, what would you do if your child died? How do you respond when, when they tell you you got breast cancer, colon cancer? How do you respond? You need to talk to, you need to, talk to some of these folks. He ain't got some real good testimony. Hey, ask Anella. Anella lost her son. Katima is a cancer survivor. Don is a cancer survivor. You ask them. Why? What keeps them? Somewhere there was enough faith to withstand that level. See, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith because it's easy to come to church and look like the church, but we don't know if you're really the church until some stuff hits you. 
We, 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 we don't, you ain't going to know how deep your faith is until some stuff hits your mama, till some stuff hits your daddy, till some stuff hits your kids. What happens when your daughter come home and tell you she pregnant? Or what happens when your son tell you he's gay? Then what you going to do? Now we're going to see how spiritual you are. What, what you, what you going to do? What you going to do when you find out that your fiance, your boyfriend came home and all of a sudden you examine yourself, you got crabs. What you going to do then? Give you an STD. What you going to do then? Guarantee you, a lot of folk just don't show up. Stop coming to church. They shame. They embarrassed. Because they knew what they were doing was wrong. But see, sometimes you better watch out because trouble will find you. Trouble will find you. What you, what you going to do when, when all of a sudden, uh, one day, your husband say, I'm not coming home. I'm leaving. Now, some of y'all be like, thank God, I'm glad you have left. I've been wanting you to leave for a long time. You know, I'm glad you're not coming. I've been, that, that was the plan, get you out of here. But, but I'm talking about when you love the man that you love, the one you with. Hello, somebody. You love the one you with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, but it's real. It's, it's, it's real. It's real. What, 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 what you find out? What, what, what you find out? Here, here go one. Here go one that blew a lady one time. She, she found out her husband was cheating. But he was cheating with a man. Mm -hmm. What you, what you going to do? See, see, watch this. It's one thing if you cheat with another woman. It's another thing when a man beats you out. Or another woman beats you out. What? You're sleeping with who? Then then watch this. Here's the thing. Here's the, here's the crazy thing. The person questions themselves. How, 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 how did I lose out to a man? I know my stuff good. How in the world did I lose out to a man? I could lose out to another woman, but to a man? Okay. Ain't that a trip? Ain't that a trip, Kay? Ain't that Paul? <laughs> he just sitting there, man. Man, he's deep. I didn't think he was like that. I... Go back to the storm. Go back to Luke 46. Come on. Come on. Keep your mind out the gutter. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. See, look at y'all. Somebody getting ready to go to Victoria's Secret today. Watch, I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> look at here. <laughs> you better not never. <laughs> look at what it says. Let's look at this. Get out, get the three points out of here. We're at Luke 6, 46. See, your mind was in the gutter, see. <laughs> Luke 6, chapter 46. So why do you call, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord? Paul's dealing with, he, he's dealing with the Pharisees, he's dealing with the disciples, and he's dealing with this whole thing of confession. Why you call me Lord, Lord, and then what? When you don't do what I say. Now, now, now watch this, let me help you, because this Lordship thing is, is hard, because you can be saved, but you got to make him Lord. You got to make him Lord. You just can't be saved. Now watch this, not just, he's not just Lord of some things, he got to be Lord of all always not Lord at all. That means how you think, your attitudes, your will, everything has got to come under the rulership of Jesus. Hello? Everything has got to come. Everything. That's why I said in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to see if you're in your faith. Does your thought life come under the Lordship of Christ? Does your emotions come under the Lordship? Doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect all the time, but come on. S most of the time, does the internal mechanism that's you come under the Lordship of him? It's a thought moment. Because most of us come to church in our body, but our emotions aren't yielded to him. 
our attitudes are not yielded to him. Come on. Our mouth is not yielded to him. Hello. See, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And that's the, that's the struggle of who is running your life. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Go to Colossians chapter 2 for a minute. I want to deal with this thing for lordship because folks, especially black people, we got problems with lordship. White people do too, but, but you know, our whole thing is we always go back to slavery. Now, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 10. When you're there, say amen. I, I'm going to take a minute. I want to deal with this. Colossians chapter 2. Um, so you also are complete through your union with what? Christ. Who is the head over every ruler and authority? Got that? You sure? So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Ain't that what that says? Okay, go over to Ephesians for a minute. Let's, let's look at this. Ephesians chapter number 5. Is it 5 or 6? It's Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse number 12. Uh, let's go back here and deal with Patrice. She deal with the whole arm of God. She did a great job. Did a great job. Let me see. Verse number 10. Ephesians 6.10. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in, the my, and in his mighty power. Put on all God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Which I thought is, is a phenomenal piece of understanding. So there's a strategy against you. Okay? There's a strategy against you. And he says you got to put on the full armor so you know how to stand against the whole, the whole, the whole, the Bible says wiles, but NLT says strategies of the devil. So there's a strategy against you. No, it's okay. For we fight not against what? Flesh and blood enemies. So therefore, people are not your enemy. But against, watch this, evil rulers. Didn't we just read that he was the head? And authorities. Ain't that what we just read? He's the head of. He's the head of. That means even principalities, powers, evil, or these evil rulers, NLT, of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That means that they are subject to him. So watch this. I'm going to put some things to rest. So now if you're fighting with devils, your fight emanates from your disobedience to his lordship. Because they can't mess with you if you in line with him. They can only mess with you because you out of line with him. That's why everything around you could be going crazy, but in you in the center of where he is, they can't mess with you. So they may come at you, but they're like, oh, we can't mess with her because she's following the Lord. Because he's the head of them. So watch this. They can't even mess with you unless he says, go mess with her. Oh, okay. Hello. <laughs> you get it? See, if he lets you mess with, if, they, if he lets them mess with you, it's only to push you to dig deeper. When you read the story of Job, God let the devil mess with Job. For what reason? To cause Job to refocus on God. He had to deal with all his friends and the loss of all his stuff, and he was sitting in sickness. Now watch this. God don't use sickness to teach you nothing. But he let the devil touch him to push him. You ain't going to do nothing unless something hits you. The average person in the church does not want to dig deeper into God, into the things of God, unless something hits you. I, I, I give you this case and example. You go through something and you crying out to God. 
Oh, Lord. Oh, God. I can outcry you. I can outcry you, man. I got a microphone. This is not your church right now. This is my church. Yours is coming in 20 years, okay? But I can out yell you, man. <laughs> he just preaching. That's all. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. But I can out preach any baby. That's why I don't worry about it. So you're going through stuff in your marriage. You're going through stuff in your job. You're going through this and you're going through that. And you're crying out to God. And then, then all of a sudden, Canel and them say, we're going to have prayer time. And you go and you pray. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, Lord, can't you see what I'm going through? And then you're on your way home and God says, okay, let's talk. Okay, okay, God, I'm glad you answered the phone. I'm glad you answered the bat phone. Now, Lord, you know, now, now, Lord, you know, I'm, my marriage, my husband, my, my spouse, he's just dripping out, and he's just doing this on my job, Lord, they just getting my money. And Lord said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. said, you remember I asked you three months ago? I had asked you to go and minister to this person over here. But Lord, don't you see, I, I, no, I ain't worried about that. That is a result, daughter, son. Uh, when I asked you to go over here, ain't it funny how you go to God in the midst of your problem? He don't never talk to you about your problem. He talks to you and talks to us about our disobedience and what we didn't do that's leading to this problem right here. He said, this is a direct result of your disobedience over here. I asked you and I told you, all of a sudden your money get funny. All of a sudden stuff start acting funny. All of a sudden now you have all these problems. And you go and you ask God and God said, but I asked you to sow that seed over here and you wouldn't do it. So I let your, your own fruit deal with you. God, he's like, God don't even care about your problem because he sees where your problem emanates from. It's from the fact that you calling him Lord, Lord. It's a double, it was, I think they called it a double imperative in that the onus is on you don't see who you really serving and you're not, you calling him Lord, but you ain't doing what he asked you to do. Uh-oh, watch this. I'm going to really get in trouble now. Watch this. You ask your spouse. You ask your kids. Why you call me mommy, mommy, and don't do what I asked you? I asked you to clean your room. Now imagine this, ladies. Now imagine this. You got a man. You, you got a man. Maybe you got a man. You, you asking him, would you do this for me, baby? Sweetheart, you know I love you. But why you keep telling me you love me and you don't do what I asked you to do? You in a relationship and ask a person. You ask now you, you married. You ain't always people that married. You know, as long as you be married, you know, you know this is routine. You know, my, what, what, my, my wife is like, you know, I'm not one of your buddies. So stop doing. So stop treating me like one of your buddies. Mm -hmm. And then in an the argument, this comes out. Why do you keep doing what I ask you to do? Do you understand I'm not one of your buddies? Hmm? And then this, 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 just like in this room right now, it gets real quiet because you're trying to figure out why this dude don't get it. But now, now let's flip it on the women. Why you keep calling me your husband, but you keep complaining over everything? See, it goes both ways. If you love somebody, I mean love them, they're going to ask you to do some things, but it takes a minute to get through. Now, I, I will say this. I, I will say this because I've been in singles ministry, marriage ministry. I think personally, I'm not saying this is God, this is scientific or anything. I think it takes men a little bit longer to get out of the single mindset than it does a woman. So it may take a man about five, six years 
Somebody said 10. That might not be a bad number. Before they actually get it. Mm -hmm. you, I'm letting my wife, next women's thing, she can, she can deal with that. I, she can come up and say something now if she wants to. But I know I put her through hell for at least six, seven years. <laughs> it might make you want to stay single. I don't know, but see. Something about love. <laughs> so here's Jesus, right? Okay, so I, I gave you that picture to tell you this. So this is for all of us, because all of us, don't, don't think that you innocent neither, ladies. Because sometimes you thinking the marriage or the relationship is somewhere that it's not. Therefore, your expectations are unrealistic because you're not dealing with the now. Brothers, give, a bro give your pass an offering right there because I just helped you out. Give your pass an offering right there. Okay, okay, watch this. Oh, watch this. Watch this. So here's God. And he says to this, both of these people, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Why, why is it? Because in Matthew, watch this. Oh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that, Garrett. Praise the Lord, man. That's my man right there. I go get me a happy meal right after service. Amen. Thank you. Amen. I help, praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. See, now watch this. Watch this. So watch this. So he says, so, so here's God. Now, Matthew 7, he says, many of you have cast out demons in my name, prophesied in my name. Now, he's talking to believers. Because unbelievers don't prophesy, they don't cast out demons. See, because now he's talking to the church. See, you doing all this stuff. But you don't know me. That's why the Bible, when it talks about relationships, says that Adam knew his wife. Live with them, 1 Peter 3, 7, according to understanding. I'm going to parallel the two. Because, see, when you know them, you're not just doing stuff that you heard about she might like. You know her enough to do what she likes. You buy her roses and she, and she allergic to roses. Because you done read Steve Harvey book and read Har See, but you don't know her. See, I heard you're supposed to give a woman chocolate. You're supposed to give a woman roses. You're supposed to give her this. You're supposed to give her that. But what if she's allergic to that stuff? Then, 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 then what you're missing is the fact that you don't know her. See, you think all the brother wants is teddies and thongs, and, and, and the brother really just need a hug. And you wondering why he's not responding to that because you don't know him. He loud, you trying to deal with him quiet. You can't deal with a loud brother a soft way. You got to deal with a loud brother a loud way. You deal with a soft brother a soft way. And you wonder why? Because you're not taking time to know them. Because Jesus says at the end, I never knew you, Matthew 7. You worker of iniquity, you worker of lawless. You, I don't know you. You never took time to open this book and get to know me. So why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? You prophesying off of what you saw. You moving in a, a word of wisdom because of what you saw. But when I told you to stop, you didn't know how to stop because you don't know me. I never told you to give that money to that person. You just did it out of what you thought you knew. Because with everything you see has got to be mixed with obedience to what he says. There was one time, there was one time, there's no lie. I was in, I was, was I in Rochester? I was in either, I was in New York. And the altar is full. So I get to, I get to, I go into prophet mode. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, I ain't asked you to do that. I lay head on one person. Boom, they go out. My motor gets a vroom, vroom, and I'm going knocking people out. Boom, 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 boom. So afterwards, God said, I ain't asked you to do all that. He said, Payton, the only person I gave you permission was that one person over there. Everything else was you.
That's why Jesus could walk in the pool of Bethesda, lay hands on one person and keep moving. Because he said, I only do what I see the Father do, and I only say what I hear the Father. See, in the life of a believer, you have to be so in tune that you may have to walk past somebody. Because God didn't give, I ain't give you, I don't, don't, don't do nothing. Don't move, don't give him nothing. I ain't, don't give him nothing. Well, well, why, Lord? Because I'm doing something, and you're going to mess up what I'm doing. Because sometimes you got to let some people hit rock bottom and everybody keep feeling sorry and keep helping the person. But when the person is dead, then we don't take responsibility that maybe we step beyond what God asked us to do. Don't call me Lord and don't do what I do, do what I tell you to do. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because, see, and that's hard for people to grasp because, after all, aren't you a Christian? Aren't you a Christian? That's why when you get with people, you better pray. Lord, what are we supposed to do? Because we think it's because we get a whole bunch of money, we're supposed to do everything. No, we better pray. God, what are we going to do with this money? Give us wisdom. Give us an understanding of what we're supposed to do. Why? Because I don't want to just do anything because it's not about us it's about him and if people see him i don't care well well you had all that money you got all that money and what did you do you didn't do anything with it. no we did something with it don't worry about what we did with it we prayed and got the mind of god see watch this we were talking to somebody and i was telling them pastoring for me is not hard because i'm doing what i'm supposed to be doing so this is not hard to me. But it could be hard to somebody who doesn't know him and being called to this. See, remember I told you I was going to do the whole thing on the family and on sex and all that. I told you I was going to do that, right? About two weeks ago, the Lord said, uh-uh, I don't want you to do this. And what I found out was two weeks ago when the Holy Spirit showed up, it's Pentecost Sunday. I didn't even know it was Pentecost Sunday. But I heard his voice. The following week, I did the same thing, and the Holy Ghost showed up. The third week was her week. Now watch this. My flesh said, well, you know you're going to have a lot of visitors here. Don't you think you might want to sit Patrice down, and you go ahead and preach? I said, no. I said, that's what's supposed to happen. That's what's going to happen. I said, if they won't come to this church, they're going to come because the Holy Ghost wants them to come, and the Holy Ghost showed up because she was where she was supposed to be. See, you got to learn how to hear his voice. So you get him and not yourself. It's easy to get me, and I can get the drumming and the keyboard play, nah, turn this up, and we can be, ah, oh, jump that, do a flip that. But is that God or is that our flesh? I don't want flesh. I've seen flesh on parade. I want the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me give you these last, let me give you these points, and let me get down here. Number one. Obedience to Christ is not optional because it is the very foundation of the Christian life. Better write it down. Obedience to Christ is not optional because it is the very foundation of the Christian life. Your life has got to be based on obedience. See, watch this. <laughs> I wish they were here. You know, some people live their whole life by their emotions. I don't like you, so I don't want to deal with you. The only reason I'm here is because God put me here. Well, then shut up and stop complaining. Guess what? In life, you ain't going to like a lot of stuff. But are you there because you want to be there, or are you there because God has you there? Because if God has you someplace, guess what? You're not going to always like it. You're not going to always have goose pimples. You're not going, I'm talking to married folk. When you get married, you make a commitment. Thank you. A covenant commitment. Through the good and the bad. Through the sickness and the good times. With money and no money. With a hoopty and on the bus. And the metro. So that's it. So be quiet. If you're where you're supposed to be, then you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, regardless of how you feel, 
once you once you say I do, you can't walk out. Now, if they cheating on you, that's one thing. But if they ain't cheating on you, they just growing, going through growing pain, you got to deal with it. Hello? They not saved? You, well, you married them unsaved, or you knew what you were going to get into. Hello? I don't care if you don't like it. Consider it before you say I do. Tell them to get out your bed, stop falling in love with the sex, and get to know the person you're getting ready to say I do to. So that you're not caught up on the sex. Because when the sex ain't no good no more, now you got to deal with what you marry. Hello? Too many people in church fall in love with the sex and don't fall in love with the person. Or they fall in love with the calling. I'm going to marry me a prophet. I'm going to marry me a prophet. Listen to this, number two. Obedience is not optional because it is the true test of professing Christians. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. I'm going to say it again. Obedience is not optional because it is the true test of a professing Christian. We just read it. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? So in Luke 6, 46, I know I'm going over a little bit, but we'll be okay. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Look at what it says, verse 46. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and when you won't do what I say? The true test of a professing Christian is obedience to Christ. Number three, obedience is not optional because it is the foundation that will withstand the test of time and eternity. Verse 47 and 48, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. Verse 48, it is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock when the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. See, don't, don't ever do anything out of chaos. Meaning, don't make life-changing decisions when you've just been hurt or you're mad. Don't do it. Because when everything calms down, you got to live with that decision. You better wait till everything calms down. And don't ever make a major decision while you're running from God. Don't make a life-changing decision while you're running from God. You better wait till you settle some things with God first. Get that straight. Do what you got to do. Go stay at home for a year and pray. And, and, uh, well, that's kind of dangerous. You tell them, you know, I'm telling you right. Because don't make no decisions and you're running from God. Because the very decision you make is going to come back and bite you when you come to your senses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've, I've talked to many people who have gotten married while they was running from God, woke up to the Lord, and realized, I married the wrong person. Now what you going to do? Did they do anything to you? No. You called to be a missionary. You get married while you run. One day you wake up, oh, I'm supposed to be a missionary. Your husband like, I ain't called to be no missionary. I ain't going to no Africa. I ain't going to Yugoslavia. I ain't going nowhere. Sit here and watch TV, watch the, watch the, watch the uh, Warriors and Cavaliers play. That's what all I'm going to do. The only place, only per place you're going to go is Olive Garden when we go to dinner tonight. That's the only place you're going. <laughs> Scariest thing in the world is wake up and realize you married the wrong person. Scariest thing in the world. You'll hate that. you but, but guess what? God can turn around what we mess up, so don't be mad. Verse number four, verse number four, I mean number four, point four. Obedience is not optional because those who do not obey Christ face sudden and final destruction. Verse 49, but anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it collapses into a heap of ruins. But you know what I, I love in all of this? Becomes a heap of ruins. You know what I love about this? Even when we screw up, Jesus still puts us back together. That's what I love about Jesus. God has taken people who've been purposely disobedient and blessed their lives despite and got them back on the right foundation. 
That's what I love about Jesus. I don't care about no other religion, about nothing else. Because what I love about Jesus is even when we screw up to the point where everything is a mess, marriage a mess, kids a mess, God can take what the devil meant for evil and still turn it around. Even when you're standing there crying and weeping and mad because your life is a mess, God takes you back in his arms, pulls you back to himself, and he picks you up on the miry clay and sets you on a rock to stay. I rap a little bit. I just don't know about my, my MC name. I can't tell you. Then you'll be down to 930 Club come check me out. Uh, I got some underground tapes coming out. Y'all wouldn't, y'all couldn't deal with that because I'm I'm spitting fire. See. He takes you off a of miry clay and sets you on a rock to stay. But see, he, 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 here's, why, here's why it's hard to get to that place. Number one, we allow shame and pride to stop us from allowing God to put us back on the rock. I'm ashamed of what I did. I'm embarrassed. Then your pride kicks in. Well, it's them church people. If them church people hadn't hurt me, if the church hadn't done this, church hadn't done that, church. When you start blaming other people for what's obviously your fault, that's your pride. That's your pride. Drop your pride. Hey, look, I messed up, God. I made bad decisions. I, did, I just did the wrong thing. I lost my temper. I lost my cool. I didn't build my house right. I didn't start with Jesus. But you got to come to a point, watch this, why I'm teaching this? Because this is the church needs to tell people this before it's too late. Before it's too late. You don't want to get to the end, die, staring God in the face. See, I'm telling you right now, you know you're in trouble when you hit, when you get on that other side and you're looking at God. It's over. If you die and get on the other side and see Jesus, you'll be like, whew. At least I'm going to be saved. But you want, I'm going to talk about the crowns. You want a crown. Proof that you dig in is the fact that you're going to get a crown. But I'm going to talk about the crowns later. The proof that you dig in deep is the crown you get. There are five to seven crowns that the believer can receive. But you got to know the crowns. You got to know what you got to do to get those crowns. So when I, when I get there, I don't want to just get there. That, that's why I say the difference between the person that builds on the sand, I would call that person average. They just happy to come to church. They just happy to, to just be, to just give a dollar offer. They just, just happy just to be here. But the digger is the person that's trying to find out what their, what their mission is. They're trying to find out where they fit in. They're trying to love people. They're trying to share the gospel with people. They're, they're trying to grow in their giving. They're trying to grow in, in their knowledge of the word. They're, they're digging. They're trying to get a little bit deeper with God. They, 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 they want, they're asking questions. The average person ain't got no questions, don't care, don't want to care, just want to come, excite me, encourage me, and then go out the door. But the digger wants to stand around because the digger has started cutting off people who are doing them wrong, have cut off people who, who are making, who are messing them up, have started letting go of people and situations, have started turning situations, and they don't have nobody, so they stay after and trying to meet people. They're staying after to try to build. Uh, they go to fellowships. They, they do things. Even if they got kids, they bring in their kids in the hope that somebody's going to help them with their baby. See, they, they dig it. They're tired of sitting in the house by themselves. They're tired of just, just, just not doing anything because the Holy Ghost is stirring them. So they start trying to tap in to that to try to find out where they can get in the river and start flowing. But what you got to understand, at the end of that is a crown. I don't want to get to heaven and not have a crown. I want to be able to put my crown at the feet of Jesus. There's a crown for pastors. 
There's a crown for martyrs. There's a crown for those that win souls. There's a crown for those who try to be saved. I don't, I don't want to just get there and not have nothing. You ever been in a room and everybody is getting congratulated on something? You, ever, you know, third grade, you know, usually third through sixth grade, they got all these best student of the year, best this, best that, ain't even. I remember I was in the third grade. I was a pretty good student up to sixth grade. And my teacher told me, Peyton, you're going to get a certificate because you're the most outstanding student for third grade. You know how good that felt. They had a whole ceremony, and for every class, they got the best student. And they call your name, Peyton Gray, straight A student. Ha <laughs> ha, got up there, big smile, mom and them. Everybody take a picture. Yeah, I got this thing right here, third grade. I'm doing pretty good. Imagine getting to heaven and people calling you. Linda Stewart, come up here. Lord, boom, you lay it on the feet. And you go off. Patrice, come on. Lord. Imagine that. Quinn, come on. Everybody's putting stuff. They call you. You say, but how would you feel? You ain't, you don't watch millions of people putting crowns in, and you get up there and you ain't got nothing to give. Because you would rather on earth be average. And you're going to see a lot of average Christians and they're going to be in heaven, happy that they got in, but sad because they didn't have nothing to give. White, black, Asian, Latino. Go ahead, play. I don't want that to be me. And when you give your crown, they say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You're not just going to heaven to stay there. You're going to heaven and come back to earth to rule. You're not dying just to go over to heaven, sit on the cloud, and throw Charmin off the side of the cloud. <laughs> Jamia tell you, when I used to have youth group, I used to say, you know, y'all, knowing y'all, y'all want to sit on the side of heaven and pee over the side of the cloud. Did it hit somebody? <laughs> no. You're learning down here how to work for eternity with him as your boss. And all this is saying is you can dig or you can just build it on sand, but the storms are going to come. And when the storms come, and he does it to let you see how your house is built, and it starts crashing, will you wake up then and say, I got to rebuild my house? I don't, I don't want that to be my, my testimony. That's why I'm digging. That's why I'm staying in it, because there's a crown at the end for pastors. And I'm not just trying to get one crown. I'm trying to get all the crowns I can get. Soul winning, being a martyr, giving up stuff that, now that's a hard one, being a martyr. Living righteous. Amen? Come on, stand on your feet.